We are as a people, inherently and historically, opposed to secret society, opposed to secret oaths, opposed to secret proceedings, secret for secret proceedings. No official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, could interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to, to, deserve to know. To know. Deserve to know. Welcome to Conspiracy Corner Podcast, everybody. It is November 21st, 5 p.m. I got a long night ahead of me tonight at work, but I got some time. I figured I'd do a podcast before work. This is Abe, your host, by the way. Um, Yeah, yesterday was a crazy day, man. We got a walkthrough coming through, so... uh, Basically had two hours of Peyton, which is uh, moving one pallet onto several other pallets, uh, splitting all the items up. Two hours of that, then uh, three to four hours of conditioning, which is basically moving all the items to the front of the shelves so it looks nice and pretty. And then after all that, basically I got like three pallets done um, and everybody else was in the same boat. And then we brought all the pallets back to the back room. So <laughs> you gotta love walkthroughs, dude. Um, but yeah, today is Sunday fun day for me. Uh, like I said uh, in previous episodes, I usually do a heavy hitting episode, and then I'll do a fun episode. Um, so today we're doing uh just paranormal. We haven't covered paranormal in a while, and. Uh, like I, I always cover uh, true stories and stuff, so let's get into some ghost stuff. Today's ostrich plumes on Sunday gingham during the week. This is Vincenttown, New Jersey in 1890. A chance visitor walking along a shaded street on the outskirts of the rambling village of Vincenttown in the heart of the Cranberry Bog country of southern New Jersey might wonder why a big, plain-faced wooden house of rather imposing size, standing well back from the street in a wilderness of tangled shrubbery and rank grass, is so neglected. Four square it looms, built of clapboard, now aged and silvery, warped and rhymed with moss and mold, four tall brick chimneys dominate the gabled roof. And well, might the passerby wonder, for neglected almost to the point of ruin is the old Lawson place. As Vincent Towners refer to the house when they discuss it, and discuss it they do, frequently. Strangely upsetting, eerie happenings often take place within the dry, rotted walls of this deserted house. Lights move past grimy attic windows at dusk. And often down the years since the tragedy took place, shrill, horror-sharp cries for help shatter the winter's night. One evening, many years ago, at the end of a deceptively quiet day, old Ezra Colby, handyman at the Lawson place, was finishing up his chores. He straightened his back, rubbed his rough oak-brown hands along the stringy muscles of his lean hips, and said to himself, Do beat all how tired I get these days, tired and lame. Standing straight, he looked down the twilight shadowed garden. He had just routed up the last of the big onions, a three-peck basket of juicy yellow bulbs to put in the root cellar. Getting plaguy dark too, he muttered. I better feed the old mare and get home to my supper. 
as we're shuffled over to a tool house near some pear trees, took a lantern down from its nail and lighted it. The dusty cat, the dusty glass cast only a feeble light, but enough for him to see, to feed, Sari, the mare. Most over your use, Sari. Don't nobody care nothing about ye but me, he said. The roomy-eyed old horse nickered, rubbing her whiskered muzzle along Ezra's sleeve. By now it was nearly dark, mid-October, but mild weather. Ezra looked up into the heavens. Bright night, lots of stars. He shut the barn door and started to leave by the side gate. As he passed the bay window of, of the dining room, Ezra noticed that the heavy plush curtains were only half drawn. He stopped. Never seen no light in this house before, he murmured. Dark as Toffet, usually. He looked closer. Even the windows what even the windows open a mite. Warm night. Guess Mrs. Alta feels close. He was about to go on when he heard the sharp slap of a hand striking flesh smartly. He stepped onto the stone curbing under the window to see better. Ezra stood rooted to the spot, holding his breath, seated at the table, which lay in a pool of light from a hanging oil lamp, were three people, a man and two women, all three Ezra had seen often during the years he had worked there, but tonight they seemed somehow different. The older of the two women, Alta Lawson, and the man Lambert, her son, were deadly quiet, watching the younger woman, Sophie, wife to Lambert, Alta, heavy set and browned, by sun and time, paid Ezra regularly, but never said two words of conversation beyond giving him orders. Lambert was always drunk most of the time. Ezra knew he lay on a couch, sleeping or singing crazily to himself. For Sophie, the only friend, one of the trio, Ezra felt great pity. Now she was holding her face where she had been struck, sobbing wildly. She started to rise from the table. Sit down, yelled her husband. He stretched across the table and grabbed one of her arms in a drunken grip. You hide that bottle, I tell you. I caught you at it. If I catch you again, I'll kill you, so help me. I ought to have done it years ago. Sophie wrenched her arm free, and Ezra saw her fall across the table a thin, faded, but still youthful figure, beating the board feebly with clenched fist. Ezra shifted his gaze to Alta. At the head of the table, she sat glowering. Her chin sunk on her folded arms. Ezra blinked. The last time he had seen Alta Lawson in the garden just before dark, she had worn a stained gingham dress, as she had always did when she worked around the place. Now her hair was piled up with ribbons in it. She was dressed in dark red velvet with shiny objects around the neck and sleeves. Lambert wore a dark jacket. His soiled white shirt was pulled open at the neck. Sophie Lawson still wore the dingy, dingy apron-covered print dress she had worked in all afternoon. Even to Ezra, who had never been farther afield than Burlington. This was a strange picture. The hysterical woman, the drink-racked man, and the silent, somber watcher at the end of the table. Ezra rubbed his chin. It ain't right. It's bad, somehow, he whispered to himself. Suddenly, the picture, so like a tableau of hate, changed. Words from Alta Lawson's lips sped like sharp flints at Sophie. Get upstairs with your sniveling. I can't stand any more of you. Lambert leaned across the table shouting, Get out! Go on! One day I'll get so mad I'll kill you for sure. Get out! Stumbling blindly, Sophie ran from the room. The sound of her footsteps on the bear's stairboards diminished into silence. Ezra continued to watch, fascinated. 
Alto sat back in her ch Alto sat back in her chair regarding Lambert with a sneer. For a long time, the contemptuous eyes of the mother held the red-rimmed, furtive ones of her son, the son whom she had planned years before to make into a rich, powerful man. Then she spat out, You drunken weakling, you sicken me. You and Sophie are two of a kind. Weak as water, I hate you both. She reached under the table and hoisted a basket onto her lap. From this, she drew a bottle of the moonshine liquor made by outlaws deep in the cranberry bogs. As Lambert watched, his mother again caught and held his eyes in a basilisk stare. Slowly, she slid the bottle along the table toward him. He grabbed it feverishly, pulling out the cork with his teeth. Ezra Colby had seen enough. He went down the path and on into the main street of the village. Feel like I've been hit a wallop on the head, he mumbled to himself. What a terrible life for the three people shut up behind the curtains of that drafty old barn of a house. Looking down the street of Vincent Town, where he had been born and had lived all his life, Ezra smiled with relief. Red or white clappered houses lined both sides of the street. No curtained windows here. Northing to hide, I, nothing to hide, I, he guessed. Light streamed out of the grass lawn, lawns. Everybody at supper now. Thinking of it made his mouth water. He hoped his wife would have cream chipped beef and cornbread tonight or fried pork and apple rings. He liked them both. Ezra opened the gate to his front yard and paused. His thoughts went back to the hateful scene at the Lawsons. In a corner of his mind stirred a memory. Alta Lawson's hair. She always wa worked around the place wearing an old straw hat from under the brim. Her hair, hair hung to her shoulders, gray and stringy. Tonight, dressed in her finery, her hair was combed high, curled, jet black, and glossy. Now how can that be, Ezra said to himself. A wig, maybe? And he fell to wondering on the vanity of women and if Alta Lawson had once been handsome. Amos Lawson, who had been Alta's husband, could have answered that question. Until Amos met Alsa, Alta, he had never seen her equal. <coughs> when Amos Lawson was 30 years old, his father, Binkard Lawson, died. He left the Lawson ironmongery and shipwright enterprises the latter at Wilmington, Delaware, to his son, Amos. Marriageable girls for miles around preened themselves and cast bold glances in Amos Lawson's direction whenever they encountered him. Even some of the touted bells of Wilmington, Baltimore, and cities as far off as Philadelphia fluttered a bit in anticipation. Amos was tall, well-built, and had a soft-spoken way with them. His appearance was clean-cut, perhaps, rather than handsome, and of course he was, for the year 1840, vastly rich, and would be richer. For a few years after his father's death, Amos kept his attention fixed on affairs at his foundry. The Burlington Enterprises waxed, waxed immensely, pro prosperous particularly those involving stoves and ornamental ironwork. Many of the exuberant iron balconies and veranda railings, the entertaining garden fences, emulating a Virginia cornfield in full stand or breaking waves on a shell-strewn beach that one sees in Charleston, Savannah, and New Orleans, who forged at the Lawson Works. Twice a year, Amos asked his aunt Aurelia Reedy of Philadelphia to act as a hostess at a ball he gave at his Burlington house. He was shy and had little interest in women, though he always agree though he was always agreeable to any that he met. His business enterprises, the iron works and the shipyards, occupied all of his time. Then one day he met Alta Corsart, a beautiful girl 
in her early twenties, who was delivering a lunch basket to her father, a foreman at the works. From Alta's point of view, it was a heaven-sent meeting, almost fate. For Amos, he had only known it. The meeting was almost a horrendous one. Alta's dossier up to this time showed her as more silly and simpering than cruel, vicious, and inordinately selfish, as she ultimately became. It is indeed quite easy to believe that when St. Peter turned the last page of Alta's file, he shuddered as with an ague. The family of Cossert, father, mother, two sons, and a daughter, had arrived in Burlington from the Ch Chanel Islands of New Jersey. Ten years before the meeting with Amos occurred. Both parents were of French-English stock and the daughter veered definitely toward the Gallic. In her frenzied moods of jealousy and anger over a fancied sight or refusal of her wishes, she was wholly French. To young swains of Vincent Town attempting to pay court to Alta, it soon became painfully evident that the pink-cheeked chestnut-haired spitfire was too much in an armful for comfort. She was determined always to be on the winning side and so became a proficient cheat at games. If she could not win, she raged. One by one, the town boys, disconcerted, left her alone. About the time the young men of Burlington gave up sparking Alta Cossert, she had her 24th birthday. This day in May, fell on the same one that marked the annual Methodist Ladies Sewing Circle Social Supper. Only a few weeks after that, Amos had become aware of her. So Amos proposed marriage to Alta. As the two were walking back to her father's small white house after the church supper, in a faltering voice, feeling greatly daring, this shy, rather diffident man, approaching middle age, offered the town beauty his heart and all his worldly possessions. Alta smiled coyly, shrugging her heliotrope silk-clad shoulders, touched the velvet ribbons that tied her green-flowered straw bonnet, and said a breathless, Yes. Odd as one thinks of it, how one short word uttered by a pretty woman can condemn a man to utter misery and he never for an instant suspect or sense impending disaster. But Amos Lawson was dazed that spring night under the New Jersey stars and the gods were not with him. That even a grain or affection for Amos entered the heart of Alta that night or ever is scarcely possible in view of, that spite, of the spiteful treatment she melted out to him during the ensuing years of their ill-starred marriage. Her reasoning was plain. Amos Lawson was decidedly worth her while. He would be easy to handle and would get her, give her a soft, luxurious life for the asking. If not for the asking, then she would get it by, by taking. Alta's destiny, as she knew it, beckoned her. She was ready and able to meet it full square. The wedding was held in mid-June under a marquee on the lawn of the Methodist Church. Alta, resplendent in the white muslin and lace, took the eye all present. Atlantic City, New York, Philadelphia. There to visit Amos's relations, the Bosworths and the Reedies, and the White Sulphur Springs in the mountains of Virginia were visited by the bridal couple. The bride, meanwhile, watched every mood, move made by the fashionably dressed women she saw at the hotels where they stayed. Carefully, she observed just how these ladies walked, at just what angle the tiny black and white lace parasols were tilted and manipulated during animated conversations, particularly with males. A really accomplished woman, she had heard, could add subtle innuendos to her conversation by the tilt of her parasol. 
The way Spanish women conveyed all manner, manner of meetings, they dare not whisper by the flick of a fan. Alta remarked intently the exact height to lift the hoop when sitting down. This maneuver was full of pitfalls. The wide spreading circles of wire taped together into a bell shape could betray a woman in the most embarrassing manner by kiting up over her face and displaying all her undergarments. Until Alta's treasure had been assembled by a dressmaker from Trenton, she had never worn a hoop. This gracefully swaying fashion had only just been taken up in America. Stories were told by returning European travelers of how Eugenie, the lovely Spanish-born Empress of France, had sponsored the hoop and originated a new manner of walking. One must seem to glide ac across a surface, the hoop swaying in rhythm. It took practice. Very well, Alta Lawson would glide with the best. After lunch one day on their wedding trip, Amos said to his bride, I am proud as proud can be, Alta, to see how all the men and women follow you with their eyes. You are the prettiest woman here by a long shot, and you wear your clothes with such style. Alta smiled at her husband, lowering her long lashes. She still aimed to please him. It was early yet. Oh, Amos, do you really think so? She bent a little farther from the waist and adjusted her coral silk parasol at a fashionable angle. You just wait until we get to Europe, Paris particularly. Then I'll get some real clothes. These will do for now. Nobody here knows the latest fashions. Why, just yesterday I overheard Mrs. Lamont tell another lady that she would never come here again. Too provincial. I found out from the clerk what that means. Countrified. Alta laughed boisterously. Hayseeds, hicks. No, Paris for me. Amos did not quite know why, but he was disturbed by this remark. He was a countryman and proud of it. Paris held no charms for him. Soon afterward, on the veranda of the hotel at the Springs, Alta made bold to ask Mr. Mrs. Mac Masters, a decidedly frigid dowager, who her dressmaker was. All four of the dowager's chins rose at an angle. Arrogantly regarding Mrs. Lawson through her amble lorgnette, she replied, I do not know what you mean. I am dressed by the Mont Monta maker. Immediately after the Lawsons returned to Burlington from their wedding trip, Alta took a firm grasp on the tiller of the Lawson ironworks. She never relinquished it again. As long as there was a tiller to grasp and let you believe that no horny-handed Old navigator out at Gloucester or the seaports of Maine ever chartered a course more determinedly. Alta was exceedingly shrewd, among other things. She believed in the element of surprise to baffle an opponent. One morning she arrived at the office of the Lawson Iron Works with a clerk of ratings, as a chartered accountant was called in 1850. Mrs. Lawson wanted to know to a jot and a tittle, just how much money was in the till, and what were the prospects of more, for she was going to need a prodigious lot of money to carry out her plans. Amos, bewildered, remonstrated with his wife for her high-handedness in a business that was not her concern, but to no avail. The new Mrs. Lawson scourged him with a tongue barbed with sarcasm. Generations of French ancestors rose up in her to lend added cruelty to her tirade. Quote, Don't you dare tell me what I can or cannot do. I'll handle this business as I see fit. You are in a rut trying to keep me, ke trying to keep it just the way your miserably old father ran it. I've heard all about that. Well, let me tell you, I'll expand this works until we'll be millionaires. Do you hear that? Did you ever see a snake shed his old skin and start all fresh? Well, you're the snake, Amos. From today on, you'll have a new skin. I'll see to that. 
Now shut up and get out of my light. Come on, clerk. Give me those figures. Pay no attention to him. Thus made aware of the cruel, true caliber of the seemingly docile woman he had married, Amos retired from the field, his heart and spirit broken. Soon afterwards, he departed for Vincent Town to live in a cottage at the edge of the village, left, by him, left to him by his grandmother. As a small boy, he had spent many summers with his grandmother Reedy in the college, which stood almost hidden in the hop vines and purple clematis, near a grove of locusts. The boy had been happy wandering in the cranberry bogs, making friends with the berry pickers. Amos had once liked to reminisce about those summer days of boyhood. He often talked with his friends about the visits. Quote, I took an almighty shine to my grandmother's little house. No matter how rich I am, I'm going to end my days rocking on that piazza. He would chuckle and nod his head in rem remembrance, but he did not end his days rocking on the cottage piazza. For one day his wife, in a fit of rage, tore the house down, literally, and scattered the gingerbread piazza trim to the four winds. For two years, Alta traveled in Europe, taking her mother along, whom she treated almost as a maidservant. She made many alleged friendships, especially among those who were useful for her social aspirations. Packing cases from abroad arrived constantly at the Burlington house, but were never opened until eventually the place resembled nothing as much as a warehouse. One day, out of the blue, the now glittering Mrs. Amos Lawson reappeared in Burlington. The accumulated packing boxes were ripped apart and soon the high ceiling old rooms, so long furnished sparsely and with almost Quaker simplicity by Amos, took on the lurid opulence of a France, of a Paris bordello. All her life, Alta's taste was rich and garish. Advisors paid enormous sums to instruct her in what was accepted in society, could not hold her taste in check when she started on a spending spree. In dress, her passion ran to ostrich plumes. Immerse, immense bonnets and broad-brimmed hats must be loaded with ostrich plumes, no matter what the immediate fashion was. The cities of Europe were combed for the finest plumes. She wore hats bedecked with ostrich plumes, morning, noon, and night. Plume-wearing for Alta was not only a fetish, it was a personal trademark. After the fifth or sixth trip to Europe, Alta declared loudly for anyone to hear that Burlington and everybody in it bored her to extension. On one of her trips, she had met a most charming architect on board ship. He was, or so he said, an authority on building the castle style of a house, the Strawberry Hill Gothic, which was sweeping England. If one wishes to be in the swim, he told her, Victorian Gothic is the ticket. Forthwith, after her sudden attack of Burlington boredom, Alta went to conquer Philadelphia. The Bosworth Reedy clan loathed her, so she could expect no help from them in establishing herself in the reserved old city. But a Mrs. Culver, whom she had met in Paris and who, despite her aristocratic family in Philadelphia, seemed always to be in financial straits, would help her arrange an entrance to the Philadelphia Society, at a price, of course. Social climbers proverbially flourish, flourish and so flourished Alta Lawson. She built her castle on a commanding knoll in the environs of Philadelphia. And a monstrosity it was, and is, of greenish-gray granite, turreted with an inch of its life. The house was started the day General Robert E. Lee surrendered at a Potomac courthouse, April 9, 1865. Took three years to build and save for the grand ball that Alta gave as a housewarming. 
which turned into a gigantic crush, not only from invited guests, but from hordes of curiosity-ridden gate crashers. It was seldom occupied. Sometimes, returning from her frequent trips to Europe, Alta would swoop upon Granite Castle as the crinolated, as the crinolated pile became known locally. Get, give a series of luxurious parties, and then, without a word to anyone, cast off and away to some such spa as Saratoga or White Sulphur Springs, or perhaps go abroad again. It was just before ground was broken to start building Granite Castle that Alta Lawson played one of the most shameful cards from her devious pack. Yet the play turned out wholly successful from her warped point of view. She suddenly became extremely friendly, even amorous, toward her woefully negligent husband. Marshalling all her forces, Alta bewitched Amos as she had done years before at the church social. Wearing a heliotrope silk dress and a flowered green bonnet, if portraits painted of Alta over a period of years by all sorts of conditions of painters present her truly, she was a most bewitching woman. Full-figured, but not too much so. She had a straight, proud carriage, a kind of rakish cheek, and a wide, egratiating smile. In any case, Amos was again completely taken in, still virile, he made the most of this surprise, welcome to the softly lit bedchamber. Then, in a shade over seven months, Alta was delivered of a son. When a nurse brought the baby into the dining room where Amos was finishing breakfast, he looked at the tiny wrinkled face and laughed heartily. He could scarcely believe his good fortune. A son, a boy to inherit the loss in ironworks just as he had inherited it from his father. Bemused these days with his wife so mellowed, even considerate of his wishes, he was convinced everything was going to be all right in this household from now on. Later in the day, he went to see Alta. She smiled at him. Amos, what do you think of him? I believe he favors you too. The loss in forehead, kiss me and let me rest again. Amos went softly out of the darkened room, treading on air. Oh yes, surely everything between him and Alta would be wonderful now. Burlington gossips, like those in any other community, did a good deal of huddling and whispering. Some of the toadies for Alta's favor said, Well, it does happen sometimes. Why not Alta and Amos Lawson? A great many Burlingtonians raised their eyebrows and smiled or sneered. Amos, oddly enough, accepted his fact that he was the father of a healthy, loudly bellowing son. Alta had suffered miserably in labor. Her convalescence was protracted and wearisome. Finally, long drives into the country were prescribed by her doctor. One day she visited the cottage at Vincent Town, where Amos had vowed to end his days rocking on the piazza. The house was old now, and the boards of the piazza were rotted by damp. Stepping up to, the in to enter the house, she tripped over a loose floorboard and fell heavily, giving her ankle a painful twist. In a sudden fury, she called to her coachman to bring her an axe that was standing again against a tree in the yard. <coughs> blow after blow, she rained on the slender columns that supported the piazza roof. Then she grabbed the fragments, the curly clues of wooden fretwork, and threw them onto the lawn. After giving sharp orders to have the house torn down and the debris cut away, she screamed, I never want to lay eyes on this shabby little cabin again. Then she limped painfully to her carriage and was driven back to Burlington. A few months after this episode, Amos, greatly aged in appearance, started building the house that was to be called Locust Grove, a bleak house wherein he was to suffer mental derangement, prison-like confinement, and a lonely death where the Furies were to ride the rafters shrieking a bedlam obligato to the frenzied screams 
of a woman tortured beyond all bearing. Planned by a Philadelphia architect named Pardo, Pardu, Locust Grove was in the style known as Southern Colonial. This consisted of a high fronted building of two tall stories and a stone basement with a narrow flight of banistered steps leading to the front door. The steeply raked roof, gabled at both ends, increased the height of the frontage. Five peaked dormers were let into the roof and four massive brick chimneys rose, importantly, against the green foliage, foliage of the locusts. Two one-and-a-half-story wings flanked the central block of the house when it was first erected. These later disappeared. Flat roof on each ring on each wing was ringed by a white painted iron grill in a design of grapevines. Although a measure of style was given the brick chimneys by a series of five pointed iron stars set into the brickwork. The windows of the locust grove, which were tall and narrow, did not fit in with the wide proportions of the design. From the very first, this house must have had an air of brooding, a secretive, withdrawn look. Certainly now, with shudderings over half a century of human misery whispering behind its walls. The old loss in place repels one, even in broad daylight. During the years that Amos Lawson was living a secluded life at Locust Grove, giving over perforce the entire management of his foundry and shipyards, men engaged by his wife were doing things her way. His alleged son, Lambert Lawson, was growing up in Italy. Alta had rented a villa in Florence where the boy lived from an early age under the care of a score of servants, nurses, and English governess. Part of each year, Mrs. Lawson was in re residence at the villa, which was named Villa Avlana. For the tall, quivering filbert trees that made green shade on the upper Terence. Later on, people wondered how the boy came to be called Lambert. The name did not appear in the roster of either his father or his mother's family. Perhaps some worldly wise ones ventured. Alta wished to perpetuate the memory of an exceptionally pleasant dalliance. If asked the reason, as she sometimes was, Lambert's mother smiled, shrugged her shoulders, and replied, I like the name. That is all that matters. The boy, so carefully tended by a retinue at the Tuscan villa, grew tall and handsome in a leonine sort of way, resembling neither Amos nor Alta Lawson in the slightest degree. He was a moody boy, given to wild fits of temper, and seemed to have no will of his own. His mother, or tutors, of which there was a constantly changing file, did his thinking for him. In short, Lambert Lawson was a very unstable, a neurotic at the age of 18. In the year Alta brought her son to the Vincent Town House to see his father, for Lambert was heir to all Amos's holdings, and it was time he showed himself in his native land. The meeting between father and son accomplished nothing. At this time, Amos was skeptical in appearance, ill and wasted from a paralytic stroke. The young man standing uneasily before his father found no recognition. He might have been any young man on earth. Lambert took one look at his father, gasped, and fled the room. The next day, Alta took Lambert to her social stronghold, hold Granite Castle, and in a series of elaborate stories, introduced him to the Philadelphia Society. He soon forgot his unhappy father. For five years, Lambert lived the rich life with a vengeance. He traveled a good deal, for goading restlessness bulked large in his nature. He ranged Europe. The fashionable watering places in America knew him, and always he was the Prince Imperial, profli profligate to the wide. As in all major things in Lambert Lawson's life, it was his mother who chose a wife for him. 
chose her and schooled her in just the way she wanted the wife of her rich, fashionable son to conduct herself. The girl she selected was a niece of an aristocrat, perennially moneyless Mrs. Culver, whom Alta Lawson had picked up and befriended in Paris before the Granite Castle phase. Sophie Dandridge, the girl selected, was the daughter of Mrs. Culver's sister, an ambitious woman who had married a Virginia Skyon, of a haughty but impoverished family, and later on found herself left with four fairly pretty daughters with no dowries. Between the maneuvering of the sisters Dandridge and Culver, a marriage was arranged with Sophie, the eldest daughter, to everyone's satisfaction, except perhaps Lambert's. But he had grown listless and far too fond of the bottle by this time to care. The marriage ceremony and festivities were brilliant. Amos, of course, did not attend, for he was now almost a non-entity. As far as his wife and son were concerned, his days were spent in a semi-darkened room at Locust Grove with a male nurse in attendance. And then, almost overnight, disaster struck. The Lawson Ironworks failed, and on the heels of this catastrophe, a bank in Baltimore took over the Lawson shipyards in Wilmington. It was found that everything under the black comet-tailed comet star, trademarked of the Lawson Enterprise, was mortgaged to the hilt. Years of colossal extravagance on the part of Alta and later her son had drained the resources of the lucrative business Amos Lawson had built. But then all management had been out of Amos's hands for many years, and the men whom Alta had placed as her confidential managers had been busy feathering their nest from whatever was left. First, the Burlington house, with all its garish clutter of lusters, Turkish rugs and trashy ornaments, was sold for mortgages. Next, Granite Castle went under the hammer. Although this edifice was an arch architectural monstrosity for the ages, it was the pride of Alta Lawson's heart. The crushing loss of her social stronghold spiked all her dreams for triumphing in society. She promptly withdrew from the world. Then almost like the last act of a Greek tragedy, four persons found themselves thrown together under the same roof in a house in a lonely grove of locust trees. A silent, almost empty house, inhabited, if one could call it that, by the ghost of a once powerful, important, kindly man, a man with no mind left, brought to this passed by two of the members of the frantic three who must henceforth live here to starve. Lambert, son to this man as far as the world knew, Sophie, his young, ineffectual wife, and Alta, a wrathful, hysterical mother, and wife to a senile wreck of a man. She of the lot would never be beaten to the earth, for her pride and hate would sustain her. For a while, it was told in Vincent Town, an attempt was made to maintain some kind of household at Locust Grove. But Mrs. Lawson managed, no one knew how, to keep a carriage and a pair on Sundays. She would drive out alone for an hour or so, richly dressed, her head always surmounted by a bonnet of purple velvet, a, verit a veritable forest of purple and cream-colored ostrich plumes waving in the breeze. Rarely was she seen on the street of the village. If she did walk out, she never spoke to anyone she could chance to meet. Marketing was done by a taciturn Irish woman who had worked for Amos for two years and who, for a while, until Amos died, stayed as a sole servant in the house. Two years after the crash, Amos Lawson was buried in the family plot in Burlington. After that, life seemed to close down completely at Locust Grove. Lights were seldom seen, for the windows were heavily curtained. The carriage and team of horses were sold. An ominous, monumental calm settled down the house of Lawson. On Sundays, Mrs. Lawson, in plumed bonnet and bead-embroidered 
Montois, relics of her great days accompanied by her son and daughter-in-law in faded, outmoded finery, would walk slowly down one side of the long, tree-shaded street of Bensontown, turn around at the canal bridge, and return to Locust Grove on the opposite side of the street. The trio talked guardedly among themselves and seemed oblivious to the people they met. On weekends, all three of the Lawsons, Alta Lambert and Sophie, were to be seen working in a truck garden at one side of the house, a large, well-tended garden which apparently provided most of the food for the family. Lambert, when sober enough to do his share, was dressed in a faded garments like a field hand. At first, the two women were neat in dark, sensible gingham dress dresses curdled up under denim aprons. Wide, shady hats of cheap straw, devoid of trimming, all but hid their faces, and there was no sign of hoops or, in later years, bustles, which the pair affected on Sundays, managing to keep as nearly as possible as in the mode. The arching years of hard work and grim poverty seemed to take a toll on Alta's appearance. She aged, of course, but gradually. Not so with Lambert and Sophie. In his face, the years were hard felt, and hers was the gauntness of abiding sorrow. He became a habitual drunkard, bleary-eyed, shambling, sometimes shouting obscenities to pa at passerbys from the tall, narrow, cobwebbed windows of his foundering house. Often at night, villagers passing the iron gate would hear wild screams and ravings, like those of a man in torment of delirium tremens. Finally, no one saw him in the garden or on the street at all. Then came the time when it was only Mrs. Lawson and Sophie who walked down one side of the street and back up the other on the defiant Sunday constitutional, decked out in ostrich plumes and matted velvet dolmens. Gossips in the town rel rallied, relied on news brought by Ezra Colby, the handyman. Lambert had become an alcoholic recluse, spending a large part of the time in bed. What kind of deal he had made with the rapscallion moonshiners, who worked stills hidden in the cranberry bogs, caused much speculation in the village. How he paid for the oceans of deadly raw brew that he swilled for thirty years still remains a mystery. Somewhere around 1890, when Alta Lawson was a gaunt old woman, Hindered in her proud stride by rheumatism, she began taking her Sunday walks alone. At first, some said Sophie, worn out by the drudgery and an ill treatment from her bestial husband, had fled back to her relatives in Philadelphia. Departed in a closed carriage during the night, rumor had it, but she had not. Sophie was worn out by the malingering congestion that was making her cough her lungs away. Except for occasional working in the garden, she kept out of sight. On a cold Sunday evening in December, Christmas Eve it was, old Miss Lawson set out on her weekly walk. She wore an ancient fur dolman, heavily embroidered with jet beads and maroon bonnet, on which the panache of ostrich plumes subjected for years to the rigors of the chancy elements had all but worn away. Not much snow on the ground, she noticed as she clasped her hands more tightly in the little sealskin muff she carried, but iron cold in the air, she muttered to herself, cold enough to strike a mortal chill to younger bones than mine. She hurried on her way. Someone saw her mount the narrow steps to the porch of Locust Grove, enter the front door, and slam it shut with a resounding bang. A few hours later, close on to midnight, Ezra Colby, bundled in a great coat and muffler against the sharp wind, came along the road in front of the Lawson place. Ezra was out late. His brother Clint, who lived half a mile or so up, to, up toward Perryville, was very sick. To relieve Clint's hard work light, wife, Ezra had been sitting vigil at his brother's bedside. Now his mind was on getting home as quickly as possible and into his warm feather bed. 
My, my, how this snow does swirl about the dooryards, Ezra mumbled into his wool scarf. As he came abreast to the front door of the Lawsons, a long, agonizing shriek rang out from somewhere in the house, followed by another longer shriek, then cries of, Help! Help! The front door was flung open by an unseen hand left to pound to and fro. More screams mounted on the night wind, long shuddering sobs of stark terror. Two women seemed to be grappling in the doorway. One broke loose, and Ezra saw that it was Sophie Lawson, her gray-streaked hair tangled in wild disorder about her face. Behind her, a man leapt out, Lambert Lawson, his face running with blood as if raked by Sophie's fingernails. For a moment, the light from the banging, hanging lamp in the hall pointed the figures high, then the flames nearly guttered in the wind. Sophie sank to her knees, and Ezra saw the third dark figure, who stood half concealed by the banging door, dressed in scarlet, her black hair awry. Alta suddenly emerged like an avenging fury. Her voice rang out above the storm. Here, Lambert, here, strike now, now, now. Into his hand, she thrust something with a long handle and a blade that caught the light of the lamp. Lambert, eyes blazing, his mouth writhing words that were whirled away on the wind swung the axe in a mighty heave. Sophie's head, cloven sheer from her body, leaped into space like a, live, like a live thing, struck a pillar on the porch, and rolled down the steps to come to a rest at the feet of Ezra Colby. In the last years of Amos Lawson's life, when he needed the care of a keeper constantly, it is said that he had a passion for playing with squills of paper set alight from candles and lamps. He would carry candles about in the series of dormered attic rooms that were his world, talking inanimately to the shadows cast on the walls, watched by his nurse. He probably amused himself for hours in a candlelit world of shadow graph. It is Amos prowling his attic do it is Amos prowling his attic domain with a lighted candle that villagers say they often see at night as fitful jerky radiances past the windows. Tramps who sometimes crawl into the deserted house for shelter rarely stop the night. Creakings of attic floorboards and ghostly lights moving against mildewed walls drive them out into the open in great alarm. A pair of students from Rutgers College once tried to spend a weekend in the old house. They were horrified twofold. Grating noises, fitful lights, and sagging doors that banged back and forth against the walls were one thing, more or less. What they had been led to expect. In fact, just what was needed for a proposed thesis on the supernatural. But to have the blood curdling, curdled in their veins by the most agonizing shrieks of a soul in mortal terror, and to see a man sever a woman's head clean off her body in the entrance porch was too much. The youths fled, leaving the notes for the epic thesis behind. And so it was for many years gaunt, disheveled, Locust Grove has stood abandoned, unwanted by whoever owns the property. Lambert died in an insane asylum shortly after the Euripidean murder of his wife. Alta Lawson, questioned by the authorities, told a straightforward story that seemed to satisfy them. She had tried to protect her daughter-in-law, who, she said, was in the last stages of consumption. Ezra Colby and he came, had come forward and told what he saw in the fitful lamplight. Could have confounded her story. He did not. On his deathbed, he related what he had seen to ease his conscience. But Alta had been dead for some years by that time. She was beyond the law's reach and could not be punished for inciting the murder. Indeed, doing everything but actually swinging the lethal axe. Alta, it is said to have gone on working in her garden, raising food to feed herself. On Sunday, she continued to take her constitutionals, but only if the weather was fine. 
Then she died all alone in the house she had always hated. It is told that when the undertakers arrived to lay out the remains of Alta, they found great disorder. All manner of trashy odds and ends from mail order houses mixed with mother of pearl and paper mache boxes. Trays and gilt furniture littered the rooms. One enormous Saratoga trunk, long enough to pack a ball gown in on train flat, was filled with unworn gowns, many bearing labels of a famous courtier of Paris, a huge portrait of Alta Lawson painted in Vienna by a painter at the zenith of her career as an American millionaire, a millionaire's on the grand tour, hung boldly torn and varnish cracked in the library. In the portrait, Alta is standing at the gates of the Prater, a land low, with four snowy lipazon ears, and the traces waits behind her. The dashing Mrs. Amos Lawson wears a spreading hoop of Parma violet silk, and an immense bonnet encircled by sapphire blue ostrich plumes, a sword thrust reminder of great days for Alta to live with one would think. One evening at twilight a few years ago, a visitor to Vincent Town was walking along the street that leads to Locust Grove, when she noticed approaching her a tall figure with an imperious walk, elaborately dressed in a costume of purple with a bustle. Rather startled, she, could help, she couldn't help staring at the huge bonnet because of a forest of waving, but definitely bedraggled ostrich plumes that strangely attired person wore as proudly as an empress wears her crown. The visitor stepped aside to make room on the sidewalk and smiled and nodded her head in greeting to the woman in purple. Giving the friendly visitor no notice, the shade of Alta Cossert Lawson, who had for so many years ridden through with life, roughshod and contemptuous of others, walked silently on. A memorable ghost, surely. On she walked, heavy eyes hooded, chin raised, bosom thrusting arrogantly, an elegant jut to the bustle. Was she re reliving her social triumphs at Granite Castle as she disappeared into the failing light, pursuing her eternal constitutional? We are as a people. Inherently and historically opposed to secret society, opposed to secret oaths, opposed to secret proceedings, secret for secret proceedings. No official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, could interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know.